All right, Aggies, we're back. We've had a week off. We've been able to rest. I've done the same. Hopefully you have too, but I'm back now giving you this preview. Loving every minute of Aggie football right now. It's such a fun time. We have a big matchup this Saturday. Number 12, Auburn comes to town. We uh, are 13 ourselves, so we've got a top 15 matchup. You know when the last time we beat Auburn at home is? Nine. 11 16 to nothing I believe is the score so it's been a long long time we are past due for a win at Kyle versus the Tigers so um, we are coming off a rusty bucket stomp of South Carolina wow what uh, a butt kick and I um, had that one pegged uh, right up until we went uh, to our backups I think I had it somewhere 42 to nothing, 45 to nothing. So I've learned from that experience. And whenever we're going to have such a blowout, and that's going to be my prediction, I've got to remember the backups are going to come in. I wish, and I kind of thought if that happened, they would hold Pat. But um, that might have been true of a team like, um, say, Kent State but uh, perhaps not South Carolina. So I have to keep that in mind coming up with this week's prediction. Uh, did a lot of great things in that game, right? So just a quick recap, uh, two 100-yard rushers, uh, a Gamecock QB that literally killed over at one point because the pass rush was so dynamic. So monster out, outing, and we're going to need another one uh, against this team, a uh, quiet Auburn team and they come to town. So here's the deal. Here's what I'm gonna try and do. I'm gonna try and convince you of who is going to win this game. Is it gonna be Auburn? Is it gonna be Texas A&M? Uh, I'm gonna present the stats to you. The one of the reasons why it is taking me until Thursday to get this together is because uh, I'm going a little bit deeper. So let me give you my thoughts, what I'm trying to do here. Um, and I'm somebody who kind of plans backwards. So thinking about this game, this, this, this wonderful game that we love to watch at Kyle Field, the purpose of this game is to get into the end zone more times than the other team. Okay? Score more touchdowns. So you have to be in the end zone to score touchdowns. Field goals, touchdowns, point is to get points, right? Field goals are a little bit lesser derivative, though. Um, and are more likely to happen, though, when you are closer to the goal line where TDs are scored. But the team that will typically get more touchdowns is going to be the team that is typically more successful in the red zone. So kind of backing away just a little bit. Um, so the team that is more successful in the red zone at converting touchdowns uh, in um, relationship also to when they are in the red zone as a defense and disallowing touchdowns uh, is a key factor. And I put this up as a huge factor because unless you have a 20-plus um, yard play, you are going to have to work your way through the red zone. There's, there's no way through that except for that one way. Um, kickoff return, punt return, those kinds of things, really huge explosive plays. Those don't happen that often. Um, usually maybe once a game, twice, depending on the team. Sometimes more, but you get the point. From there, you back off and you are then between the 20s and or from your opponent's uh, red zone back to where you got the ball likely on a kickoff or a punt. So what's taking place in that middle game? A lot of what's taking place in that middle game are, in my opinion, two main things that are important. One negative plays um, we're going to talk about this a lot more tonight so negative plays negative plays can make your life miserable first and 10 turns into first and 15 second and five can turn into third and 10 real quickly uh, first and 10 can turn into second and 12 those are more difficult to convert into first downs and so first downs i believe are a big key as to how many points a team is going to score. You need to put first downs and string them together if you want to work your way down the field and then through the red zone. Again, it, it, when you're in the red zone, it's going to be real important to run the ball, and we're going to look at that closely too. But backing off in that middle game again, you, and, and you're on defense and or offense, those negative plays, those could happen from tackles for loss, sacks, penalties, 
and you could get those yourself on defense. You get a five yard sack on your opponent uh, as a defense and um, they're trying to convert perhaps uh, third and 15, it's just not as likely. And this is common sense, we know this. So we're gonna look at those key factors um, and then we are going to sort of map them to points to get an idea about where our teams sit in comparison to each other in these key categories and then what a predictive score might look like. So you'll hear a lot of people talk about yards per pass, uh, yards per carry, and we're gonna look at those a little bit, but I'm trying to take a look at this more situationally. Red zone, being in the red zone is a situation. Being in the middle game is a situation, okay? So it's nice to have, say, more than seven yards per pass and more than, say, four, four and a half and up to five yards per carry, but, um, being able to put those together and get first downs is what's really going to move the ball unless you are putting together 30, 40, 50 yard plays. And those just don't happen quite as often. So um, if you like all that, if you like all that reasoning and, and uh, like, subscribe, comment, tell me what you think are important categories and what you think about that, those ideas about how to work backwards to figure out how these teams are gonna match up, right? Um, hope you enjoy this. Let's go ahead and uh, jump into the numbers, take a look at Auburn first and uh, some of their, their foreground, and then we will hit the numbers hard and heavy tonight. Samuel Shanker, who's a tight end, who lines up in front of Bigsby. He has the first down, pulls his way across the 35-yard line. Similarities, Bo Nix and Matt Corral both can hurt you with passing and running on target to Zavian Capers. The son of a coach. He's in trouble. And this is what he can do. And Matt Corral as well. It'll be fun to watch all night long. He dives for the first down marker. And it looks like he came up about a yard short. Well, seven year run at Boise State. Straight ahead. First down for Tank Bigsby. We had the tight end Shanker in the game. They had him split out to the right. Good throw. Nick's on target. Kobe Hudson. First down. Here are the leading tacklers on the team. Campbell the leader. Reese number two. Bigsby turns the corner. Lowers the shoulder and has a first down. Hard-nosed team under Harson. They spent a lot of time on old-fashioned fundamentals. They have a hard-nosed quarterback who's in the end zone. Knicks caps the opening drive for the Tigers. But we also have almost coming up. So remember that Luke Deal, the tight end, is going to get the key block. Beautiful job. Oh, 42 carries last two games. He sings one. Connects on the slant for the first so, down to Dontario Drummond. Snoop Connor part of that rotation. And running back, Corral right on target again. Jacor Pearson the first down. Incredibly accurate on that throw. Most accurate passer in Ole Miss history. 67% career on target again. On the defensive side, Alvin Tally three sacks. After the play fake on target again. First down inside the 10. It's the tight end, Casey Kelly. Play clock at one. Design rollout for Corral. He's in trouble and chopped down behind the line of scrimmage by Zacoby McLean. Try from just inside the right hash mark. And it is good. Outside. Tank Bixby, the running back here for Auburn. Big hole, big run. Big man in the Rebel territory to the 46-yard line. A.J. Finley finally able to run him down. My favorite place to start is in the red zone. We all know, even though Missouri's Drinkwitz disputes this, that turnovers have the largest influence on who wins a game. The issue with turnovers is they are hard to predict. With generally a low number of turnovers, a swing of one or two in either direction can have huge effects. Couple this with the few instances that it happens, some games with few turnovers, some with none, predicting volatility. This all gives a wildly uh, different picture depending on how you want to predict it. To me, 
Red zone offense and defense is simply more predictive of an outcome for a game since percentage-wise, how often you convert in the red zone translates well to points, especially when considering TDs versus field goals. Turnovers and their impact can be misleading. So let's jump in these red zone numbers that you see here. Auburn is converting in the red zone 92% of the time on offense, good enough for 13th in the country. Since entering conference play, they've been able to maintain that conversion rate despite the would-be uptick in quality of opponents. However, when facing ranked opponents, they only convert 81% of the time. A&M, on the other hand, is converting at 85% overall, but has seen an uptick when in conference and versus ranked, getting in 100% of the time. Although some of these have not all been uh, touchdowns, some have been field goals. They've gotten five TDs to four field goals. One thing the Tigers have going for them is that they have had to kick few field goals by converting most of their red zone opportunities into touchdowns. They are doing this at a rate of 75%. A&M seems to have a clear advantage on the defensive side of the ball when in the red zone at first glance, but maybe not. Auburn is allowing points 80% of the time and right at 75% for both in-conference and ranked opponents. A&M is allowing scores at a rate of 72%, but is at 81 and 83% respectively on the other metrics. A&M is worse in conference and versus ranked than Auburn by the numbers. So does that mean Auburn has the edge? Not necessarily. A&M has faced two ranked opponents, Arkansas and Alabama. Arkansas was one of our worst games, and we know this team is different from when we played the Razorbacks. And that was one of the Razorbacks' best games of the year. Alabama being one of the best teams makes a lot of sense why there would be an uptick. Auburn, on the other hand, had played a ranked team out of conference in Penn State, which has now collected three losses the last three weeks. Arkansas has done the same, save a timely matchup with Arkansas Pine Bluff two weeks ago before their bye week last week. And then there's their matchup with Ole Miss, who was nearly without a whole starting wide receiver court. It seems as if their ranked opponents were not quite what they were made out to be when they were played as ranked teams. Drilling down further, let's look at other data to figure out what each are doing in timely possessions. Auburn runs at a rate of 3.6 yards per carry when in the red zone to A&M's 2.4. This supports the Tigers' high conversion rate. Both teams are quite even in third down and turnovers. So right now, Auburn has the edge in the red zone on offense, but A&M has the edge in red zone defense. Perhaps these will even out. Even out. But the game isn't only played inside the 20s. For these numbers to hold true, a team has to get to the 20. So let's look at what's going on in between. And let's start with rushing. Overall, the teams are even with Auburn taking the edge at 5.4 yards per carry to AM's 5.3. I tend to think an even uh, deeper dive is needed when these are this close. So look at what each team did in August through September and then in October. Here we see a stark difference. Auburn did 7.4 yards per clip through September, while A&M did 5.2. But in October, Auburn only managed 3.9 to A&M's 5.3. Obviously, A&M did better in October, but something else that jumps out to me is that A&M has been more consistent throughout, and as of recent, is pulling better rushing numbers. My takeaway from this data is that I have good reason to think A&M will hold with their current numbers since they are consistent and that Auburn can either be really good or mediocre. Recent data tells us it may be the latter, and so I'll give the edge to A&M here with the caveat that a high-level performance from Auburn is certainly possible. Not as likely, but if it happens, it could spell trouble for A&M. All right, so what do you think so far? We're only about a third of the way through. We have a lot of numbers to dive into. This has been one of the most informative things that I think I've ever done when breaking down a team for my own personal uh, outlook to see what I think that they will actually do. If you're an Auburn fan, tell me what you think. Do you, do you see your team this way? Um, do you think that these teams are this close? I mean, it's, it's pretty close, although I think I see an advantage for A&M currently uh, through these few categories. Will it continue that way? I'm not sure. I know, actually, but we haven't got to that yet. So you'll find out, and then you'll get to make up your own mind. Um, but this is um, 
a really big game. They're very evenly matched, so something very in-depth is going to be needed to really decipher between these two. One of these teams is going to have an opportunity, if things fall right, to represent the West in the SEC title game. Need a title, uh, timely loss from Alabama, either to Auburn in the Iron Bowl or somewhere else along the way. Will that happen? I don't know. Um, I hope so, and I hope A&M comes away with this win and gets the opportunity to represent the West. Uh, but um, we have a really good game at hand, so if we're going to figure out where the predictive power is on, and which team to lay that with, we're really going to have to um, consider a lot more. So let's get to it. All right, now let's look at the teams from an aerial view. Both are fairly even through the air overall. Auburn is managing 7.4 yards per attempt. A&M is getting 6.9. This is low on average because A&M struggled mightily in August through September with a pedestrian 6.4 yards per attempt. Meanwhile, Auburn was holding it down with 7.1. But since Calzada had his coming out against Bama on October 9th, ever since A&M has blown up to 7.4 yards per attempt. I think this is fairly even at the current state, but the slight edge has to go to Auburn, who has been consistently performing well in this area. So how about defense? We can look at how much yardage each team allows overall and per play, but I tend to think these other categories serve to tell a better story. My philosophy is related to negative plays. Negative plays make drives more difficult. First and 10 can easily turn into first and 15 with a false start. With a timely tackle for loss, a team can be second and 13. Get a sack on second down, and you could be staring a third and 10 in the face. Long yardage on third down is the key, and that happens more often when a team gives up some sort of negative play. Negative plays are drive killers, plain and simple. It's much harder to get a first down after a 10-yard holding penalty. So, how do these teams stack up? On defense, both teams are getting close to the same number of sacks, and that has held through October. Both teams also tend to get the same yardage loss and are regularly adding five additional yards that their opponent's offense must pick up the following play in order to get a first down. A&M holds the 16th position in this ranking nationally while Auburn is 29th, but not a lot of difference between those. On the flip side, both are doing reasonably well, probably above average in sacks allowed. A&M gives up 1.63 sacks per game, and Auburn is 1.13. Not a huge difference, but for these numbers to venture into the decimal ranges, that means at some point more than one sack is given up. Auburn is giving up that extra sack once every eight games. A&M is giving that extra sack up approximately six times out of eight games. So that extra sack could be the difference in a drive that grabs points, or even a field goal in such a close game could be the difference. Clearly, it's more likely AM will give up that extra sack, but it could even out since we perform slightly higher at gaining sacks on defense. So how do we make heads or tails of this then? We look to see what's happening recently. In the last three games, AM has allowed one sack, and that was against Missouri. None against Bama, none against South Carolina. Auburn has allowed six, four to Georgia, two to Ole Miss, zero to Arkansas. I'm inclined to think that two sacks against Missouri is not a major deal, and without that outing, a and could have zero. However, if we played Bama again, would we give up zero? Likewise, how much weight do we lend to Auburn's tally with the bulk coming from the number one team in the nation when they gave up four to Georgia? So, a lot of things to consider for context when uh, putting this into play for how we might predict the game. Still pretty unclear, still pretty even. Let's dig deeper. Let's get into some more data. In the last three games, AM has given up 14 tackles for loss, 4, 5, and 5, to Bama, Missouri, and South Carolina. Auburn has given up 6, 3, and 4 to Georgia, Arkansas, and Ole Miss for a total of 13. Still, we seem to be quite even. On to QB hurries. Auburn had 6, 0, and 5, respectively, to the same competition. AM allowed 0, 0, and 6 for a little more context, A&M is the only team with any garbage time play in the last three games, and our backup O-line was getting bashed during that time. QB hurries are subject to nature, but after this third level look, I feel safe in declaring A&M with the edge in negative plays generated versus allowed. However, 
Auburn is the clear winner in committing penalties. In October, Auburn has had 20 penalties for an average of 43 yards per game. A&M has had 27 for 63 yards per game. And A&M is committing 1.5 more infractions per game. One more penalty is not enough to make up a 20-yard difference. So you can deduce that A&M is committing more 10-yard infractions to Auburn's 15-yard or 5-yard penalties. These are, of course, more detrimental, and A&M is going to need to clear this up to gain the advantage in this area. But, you know, I like to dig. A&M's opponents in October in the last four games have committed 34 penalties for 78 yards. Auburn's have only committed 20 for 44. So, in perspective of uh, the opponent's uh, uh, situational stats, A&M has an advantage there. So this may be a wash, but we're going to give the edge to Auburn. But that is simply for uh, opponent penalties. Overall, in regards to negative plays, I'm going to give A&M the edge, and here's why. Penalties only account for about five plays a game. Tackles for loss, whether those be sacks on the QB or other plays made behind the line of scrimmage, account for 10 plays per game conservatively. Factor in that AM's opponents are giving up more as of recent, AM seems to be the clear winner here. So, taking that into consideration, AM in negative plays is going to be my um, clear favorite. All right, so it's really close so far in all these uh, categories. There's been about nine of them. Uh, let's recap those, but uh, we got one more situational stat to look at. Um, that I think will make the difference and give us the best overall picture and will make us some uh, predictions for the final in this game. Um, so let's go over and see what the, uh, the score tally is through nine. All right, so right now I've got the uh, tally at 5-4 a &M. Red zone O goes to a &M. Red zone rush, rush overall, sacks, and opponent penalties all go for a &M. but Auburn does take tackles for loss, penalties, uh, passing, even though that was a slight edge, and red zone D. So it, this is stacking up just like it looks like it should with a number 12 versus a number 13. Um, we've shown a few other uh, low line areas that could make some differences in this game, um, but you know, we still have not quite fully looked at the middle game. We still have one major area to look at. So let's look at that and then we'll get uh, final thoughts. All right, last key stat is first downs. First downs, again, as I was saying before, these are the things that enable you to sustain drive. So um, first downs gain and given up. When we want to have a good idea of how likely a team is to get points from a drive, uh, we look at first downs. Drives that are sustained or uh, start with a good field position increase the likelihood of producing points. The ability to get first downs means a team has the ability to sustain drives. If they don't produce points by stalling out in the end, there's a good chance the field position battle will have been won on that possession. And of course, better field position also means higher likelihood of a scoring drive. So in my view, first downs have a very close tie to scoring. Something to keep in mind as we go down uh, this avenue is that teams typically average about 11 possessions a game. Give or take one possession will likely account for 95% of games played. So 10 to 12 possessions per game should encompass 95% of all games played. All right, so let's make sense of what you're looking at right here. So this is saying that Auburn is getting uh, 5.2 first downs per touchdown. That's what it takes for them to get a touchdown. AM is slightly more efficient at 5.1. Again, meaning this is how many first downs each team must get or are averaging before they get a touchdown. Auburn is getting 26 first downs per game. AM is getting 21.8. This is overall. What does this translate? What does this say? Essentially, what this ends up uh, boiling down to is that Auburn is getting 1.32 points for each first down. AM is getting 1.36 points for each first down. Okay, so you can see how AM is either slightly more efficient 
or slightly more productive. It's not amounting in many more points with that 200th of, of a difference there, but it is something that is going to be factored in because when you have a difference in how many first downs you're getting per game um, versus how many points those end up resulting in, you can end up with some different totals. And that's what we're gonna be looking at here shortly. Now, that look at first downs was overall. Now we're gonna look, like uh, look at this uh, more recently, so to see what, what the teams are doing currently, not, not 10 weeks ago. Um, in October, uh, Auburn is uh, getting or taking 6.1 first downs before they get a touchdown. A&M has now lowered that to 4.6, so becoming, say, highly more productive. And there's some reasons why this may take place, right? A&M could be starting with a better field position. A shorter field means it's going to take you less first downs to get to that end zone. One of the other things that it could possibly mean is that A&M is having more explosive plays. So you may get uh, uh, three first downs and then you have a 30 or 40 yard play, which we know that a chain can do these kinds of things. Spiller can do these kinds of things, right? And so that is one of the things that we are seeing. But this is what they are doing as of recent. You can also see Auburn's trend. They've dropped the fill, uh, first downs per game down to 22 and a half, and A&M's has gone up slightly to 23.5. The points per first down differential has changed quite starkly here. So. Auburn is now only getting 1.14 points for each first down. This is how it translates if you boil it down to per first down. a and has now increased to 1.5. may not seem like a lot, right? But we're going to see what this translates to whenever you consider how many first downs a team's getting, right? Um, and so with a and getting, you know, points for each um, 4.6 first downs, it's going to translate a little higher, especially since our first down total per game has increased in the month of October, and it's going to make some, some, some fairly startling things. But we're also going to look at how this would translate to on the opposite side of the field um, and how many points we each team will be allowing uh, based off of what they do by first down too. Okay, so let's venture over there real quick and take a look. If we take the numbers that each team was putting together from August through September and the number of points each team was getting per first down, it will translate into Auburn getting 30 points to A&M's 32. Pretty negligible difference though. However, if we look at what's been going on in October, we now see an expansion. Um, uh, we're now predicting a score of 35 for A&M, 25 for Auburn, and that's because those points per first down uh, changed so drastically in this this last uh, three to four games. Um, we got to keep in mind who we're playing um, and who they've played and those kinds of things to keep this you know realistic and not let these just you know numbers speak without context. But um, right now, both of these numbers are predicting that AM comes out a winner, um, and then the second one, the most recent number, October, pretty significant winner. I think it's still important to see what both teams are allowing first down wise per point uh, scored through first downs. So let's make a prediction off of that too and see if we come up with something different. All right now, so Auburn, Auburn's ratio of points per first down is exactly one. a ms ratio is 1.06, not seemingly significantly higher, but it is saying that a and is allowing more points per first down, right? And that could translate into a higher score. Um, however, Auburn is allowing their opponents to get 24 first downs per game. a and actually only allowing 21.8 first downs per game. So that's why you end up, see, up seeing this score prediction uh, from this side of the ball come out as in, um, 24 to 23. Now this is not the score for AM and the score for Auburn. It's the score for their opponent. So that 24 is what the prediction is for Auburn's opponent. In this case, it will happen to be AM. 23 is the prediction for AM's opponent. So this this sort of cross-sectional way 
is actually predicting uh, each other's score, so opposite. So this is a prediction of 23 to 24 in favor of A&M. So now we have a third view that has now predicted um, an outcome of winning for A&M ever so slightly. Um, and with two of these coming out um, as uh, very close, um, it's important to refer back to all those other factors. And so when you refer back to all those other factors, you know, what is it telling you? Uh, A&M won five out of four of those other categories. When you look at uh, first downs, we then end up basically taking the next three. Or um, if you want to count the first downs penalty as one factor, we then take six out of four. Um, or six to their four, or six out of ten. How significant is that? The line right now has been varying between four and four and a half. I believe it started at six in favor of A&M, uh, went down to four. Uh, I don't know if I'm so much going to say that what I've presented to you here is a way to predict the score, but so much as a way to say this is probably likely to be maybe more of the point differential between how this game plays out. So uh, one prediction had it at a, a two-point difference one at a 10 point difference and one at a one point difference. Uh, so a total of 13. Um, and uh, so out of four games, I'm sorry, out of three games with a 13 uh, point deficit there, you're looking at somewhere around four points uh, per game. So it seems like it may be right on. It just so happens to be coincidental to come out like that. What am I feeling? What am I thinking? Um, it's hard to say. Um, you know, we have a lot of potential. The narrative right now is that we've only really played one decent team. Uh, Missouri and South Carolina don't really give us a good mark, but I think we took care of those teams exactly how we were supposed to take care of those teams as well. Big factor is, is that we are playing at Kyle Field. You know how that works out. That's, that's going to be a major benefit to the Aggies. Um, we've had a bye week, so we've had a lot of time to prepare. We've had a lot of time to get healthy. Uh, so we should be coming in full steam ahead. I really want to get this win. We have not beat them, like I said, since 1911. So I'm trying to think if I'm going to be wrong and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to predict the Aggies to win. I'm not sure where I am on the cover just yet, but I'm going to predict them to win. If I'm wrong, I'm trying to think of how would I be wrong? How is it that Auburn could win this game? Auburn fans, if you're watching this, tell us what you think. You know your team very well. You have a very respectable team. Um, you know, if I had not gone to uh, A&M, not from Texas, maybe a little closer, you know, ties to uh, Alabama and that state, I could see myself going to Auburn. Um, uh, so, um, love to hear from you guys. Uh, really, really love what you bring. I'm thinking, trying to put myself in y'all's position, that... Bo Nix is a bit of an X factor. He looks to me that he's throwing the ball well. Um, I'm not saying that he has, you know, uh, been just the most accurate, but he's he's doing well with the ball, and he is a very elusive quarterback. If you saw some of that game film early on, he's elusive. Um, he is about as close to Johnny as we've kind of probably seen, and AM tends to struggle with mobile quarterbacks we we just we just always have and, and i mean i guess who doesn't right but um it's going to be important for us to be in our gaps and it's going to be important to um when pressure is applied to make sure that we come away with a tackle because letting him get out of the pocket uh gets first downs and it gets them in chunks um and so those um you know, six touchdowns or six first downs per touchdowns can easily drop quickly when you're getting 20 yards sometimes on a first down um, and getting those explosive plays. So I, I definitely think um, Bo Nix is somebody to really, really watch out for. Tank is uh, also a very dynamic player. Um, and, uh, you know, he came in with a lot of luster. It maybe has seemed to be a little tarnished. That's not to take anything away from him necessarily, but maybe the results just haven't quite been there like it was predicted at the beginning of the season. Um, still very high quality running back. And um, 
I mean, let's face it, Auburn has given us trouble at home. Uh, at home. I, I was just, uh, I had caught myself making an error. I thought we had won in 2012, but I'm overlooked it. We won in 2013. It was our first time to, um, uh, we played, well, we, we won in 2012, and then we lost in 2013 at home. That was the, the horse collar incident, right? And was still aggravated about that. Um, so we have not beat this team in a very long time, and now is as good a time as any. So let me know what your predictions are. Let me know what you think. Hopefully you really like this type of situational analysis, um, and hopefully I was able to convince you based off of what I've showed you. And Auburn fans, you can be the judge because I'm what I'm presenting is that A&M is going to win this game. Um, uh, at least on paper, right? We still have to play the game. That, but the, the prediction stands true. Did I, did I convince you on paper that this is the way this game should turn out if it's played out the way that it's supposed to be played out, right? Um, we're, you know, save the X factors, right? But um, did you come away thinking a and going to win? That's the only conclusion I could really come to based off of these factors. So, um, again, tell me what you think. Can't wait to hear, and glad to be back. We'll see you again for a reaction when this is all over. And then we'll be back at it again next week, giving you another preview. So, until then, gig them. Let's go beat the hell out of Auburn.